think about everything you know and then think about why you know it. Are our thoughts simply hardwired from previous experiences or do we have actual real control over them? And if we do have that much control over our thoughts, then how do we filter out the objective reality from what we just want to be reality? You clicked a link and ended up here. And you're probably wondering what all of these questions have to do with the title of this video. This rabbit hole runs deep. You might not have expected what you got, but if you stay with me on this trip, you might be able to understand one of the most convoluted games of all time. It actually took fans years to figure out exactly what's going on here, and more importantly, what it all means. Now, I've made a lot of these videos, but this one deserves a special treatment. Trying to clarify what's going on here is a complicated task from any angle. So, in order to properly explain what happens in this game, I'm also going to have to explain things about the psychology behind marketing and hype. Nightmares grounded in personal realities. The illusion of choice and subjectivity of truth. And buildings! What do all these things have to do with Metal Gear Solid 2? A lot, actually. Because at the end of the day, Metal Gear Solid 2 is a postmodern deconstruction of the deceitful and manipulative qualities of its medium. When people refer to Metal Gear Solid 2 as being a postmodern game, it's important to know exactly why that's the word they chose. It's important to understanding the world in which it was created, and what that claim says about that word and what it says about modernism as well. So many people, including Kojima himself, make this claim that it's postmodern without properly defining the concept. But in order to define the postmodern, you also have to know what it means to come after the modern. For arts and entertainment, things don't become postmodern just by confusing readers with fourth wall breaks and self awareness. MGS2 isn't postmodern just because Raiden flips through in game options on his way through a life size simulation of the first game, nor is it because he throws away dog tags with your name on them, or because lines of code come crashing through the walls in the end. It evokes the collective underlying social thoughts of the entire postmodern era, and that's what postmodernism essentially is, just a word that references a certain period of time that came after what people called modern. The word postmodernism first got tossed around in the early 70s to reference a new wave of architectural designs that were a response to the unnatural looking glass blocks of earlier decades. By comparison to the modern, postmodern buildings look like similarly unnatural glass blocks, but with only a few superficial decorations. And that's an important observation. Postmodernity is very much a response to modernity, but it's still working under its same assumptions and limitations. It's very much an extension of a wider cultural shift that started about 150 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution triggered a chain of events that shifted economic conditions towards a new kind of collective cultural thinking. Basically, at some moment a hundred years ago, time and space compressed and everyone went crazy. The spread of global capitalism and industrialization led to imperial competition that resulted in World War I, and during that conflict, common sense as we knew it changed. The brutal efficiency of the factory and the railroad meant that time was money and travel was cheap. The sheer scale and longevity of World War I meant that all of humanity was equally capable of the same atrocities. Modern art evoked this cynical pluralism by depicting the same scenes from multiple angles at the same time, always with the clock constantly ticking away in the background. Virginia Woolf and James Joyce happened, and these writers depicted characters who were fragmented, bipolar, or self-aware of their place as characters in books. When city planners jumped on board, they built wide-open celebratory squares that eventually became used as rallying points for brutal regimes. Everyone's morbid obsession with the dehumanizing efficiency of this economy led to another world war, with an even shorter wind-up and cool-down than the last. But industrialism never stopped. In the 70s, the first world's manufacturing economy turned over into a service one. Cheaper jobs got outsourced to other capitalist countries thousands of miles away. Communications got faster, and yet again, so did traveling. The fleeting nature of time and the volatility of business now means that workers live in episodic moments of the present. Kids grow up in phases, and the unemployed are in between jobs. 
We're always trying to plan ahead, so the future has been folded into the present. And on top of that is the confusing realization that this entire planet, which is actually quite a small and lonely place, is filled with an astronomical number of human beings who all need to be individually respected. In the midst of an entire society of identity crises and contradicting moral values, a new search for greater personal meanings arose. People want a solid moral foothold in this very unstable world, so individuals peruse in and out of major lifestyle brands and political movements. So the postmodern arts and entertainment that evokes the postmodern era are inherently schizophrenic. You have characters with a conflicting sense of time and place, who often have to juggle multiple plots at once, each one with an uncertain context. If modernist fiction popularized meta-narratives, then postmodern fiction popularized metafiction. You have highbrow literature delivered through lowbrow mediums, stories that tell stories about other stories. You have a deconstruction of what narrative rules constitute realism, and fiction that's critical of those dogmas. The nature of postmodern art is to question the dogmas of what came before it. That is, the rules and techniques that were accepted as permanently modern despite ironically characterizing a very brief period of history. And one of the most effective ways to do that is to highlight the context in which art is presented, oftentimes by pranking the viewer into questioning whether or not it's art at all. These urinals and soup cans didn't take a vast amount of skill to make, and they're not pretty to look at, but what's important about them is the context that they're presented in within the art gallery. The real showpiece is how ready people were to put this stuff on a pedestal. These artists knew that they already had fans who would justify whatever they made, and they also knew that people would care enough to argue about it, and even that is a part of the context these pieces are actually showcasing. They use this context to deliver messages about taste and class, or about reproduction or originality. In other words, postmodern art asks questions about art by putting it in an unfamiliar context, and a proper understanding of the context that Metal Gear Solid 2 was released under is required for a proper understanding of the game. More specifically, understanding that context is required to understand how the incredible differences between these two chapters were designed to manipulate fans. Most importantly, the manipulation actually began long before the release of the game. There were already Metal Gear fans who would have bought it and loved it, based on the name alone. It's a bit difficult to remember that this game might have been the most anticipated product of its time. Sony was distributing VHS tapes with trailers. People were buying Zone of the Enders by the thousands just for a 20 minute demo. It was a massive step up in terms of fidelity than what we had seen before, and would finally meet the standards for what an actual next-gen game of the time would look like. It was also still a young series, following a cliffhanger ending that left plenty of room for an exciting and dangerous sequel. The hype was massive, and throughout it all, they never once showed us what 90% of the game was actually going to look like. They never hinted that Raiden was going to be a thing. He isn't even on the back of the box, but for all intents and purposes, he's the main character of the game. But even after the game's launch, you'd be forgiven for not knowing that. After all, the first hour is a carefully constructed tech demo designed to completely pander to fans. This opening tanker sequence is the most convincing piece of misdirection of them all. It exceeds what was shown before. It carefully sets up for a sequel that's almost too good to be true, while also fan-servicing the living daylights out of Snake and Otacon. The first cutscene keeps Snake hidden behind smoke and mirrors for an entire three minutes before the grand reveal. And once that's over with, it isn't shy about showing off the gameplay changes either. The game points out that guards are tougher than before, and that you can shoot out lights to play with shadows. There's multiple entryways in a non-linear level design, but the layout of this place funnels you into accidentally discovering the vast amounts of detail they put in here, and how those details affect gameplay. Even Snake's wet footprints don't go ignored, and neither do all these breakable objects, which were meticulously animated before the days of physics middlewares. The attention to detail is crazy, and so far, the callbacks are tasteful. They even throw in a Raven Revival fake-out to foreshadow the craziness that's to come. Everything about this tanker is built to showcase the features of an ideal sequel. It's exactly what players expected and wanted out of Metal Gear Solid 2, which would have been a creative and bold, but also self-congratulatory sequel. But then, Snake dies. You're an hour into the game, and suddenly the game as you know it starts all over again. And this time, it's an awful lot like the first game. You see Snake dive into the docks of a terrorist-occupied workplace. 
and he wears a mask while waiting for a guarded elevator to arrive. Even the colonel's there, saying the exact same lines as last time. There's so many unsettling and outlandish little details in the beginning of this chapter that it's hard to keep track of them all. The tone is considerably darker, and the levels are now linear metal corridors. The dialogue is really stiff and dull, and we find out that Raiden, our new character who couldn't be any more different than Snake, is going through an almost nightmarish ordeal. His name, his relationships, and even his blood have been taken from him for the sake of this mission. You're currently using artificial blood primed with nanomachines. What did you do with my own blood? It's being kept in cold storage. It will be circulated back into your body when you return. And these codec calls are relentless. Seriously, you play the game in one minute bursts here. The frequency of these calls got a lot of backlash in reviews of the first game, and they were light in the tanker. So you have to wonder why they so furiously return to re-explain tutorials and exposition that you already know. This issue could not have passed playtesting. It had to have been included deliberately to make a point. If the first few minutes of the tanker chapter are what a great Metal Gear Solid sequel would look like, then the first few minutes of this chapter chapter show just how much worse it could have gone. There's stuff here that lashes out against both fans and critics. It's a facade that the game maintains up until the very end. The general pacing of the plant chapter looks a lot like the first game, and that was deliberate too. Though it's a totally new story, it's a story both about the events of the first game and also about how we processed those events. S3 stands for Solid Snake Simulation. It's a development program to artificially reproduce Solid Snake, the perfect warrior. The result is a Foxhound Commando. When Foxhound no longer exists, a simulated Solid Snake shaped by VR regimen. Sound like someone you know, Jack? At the very end, the S3 plan reveals that the fans' expectations have been carefully toyed with this whole time. It almost makes a mockery of them, and certainly makes a mockery of Raiden. If the nutshell of the story involves shadowy conspirators who construct a command center that allows them to fabricate grand lies, then it's easily an extended metaphor for the game itself, with Raiden being the analog for the player's real-life role as a Metal Gear fan. He's a delusional video game addled rookie who was a fan of Solid Snake, and he believed the conspirators' lies up until the very end. And once the curtain's pulled, he's frustrated and confused, and doesn't really know what to think of it all. It was a deliberate bait and switch. Kojima knew that players weren't expecting this. He knew that Raiden was unappealing and would be unpopular. He knew that people weren't gonna like it, and used that to tell the story. Like with the urinals and the soup cans, it's a piece that uses context to make its message. The message is about fanboyism and hype. It's about the environment that surrounded the game's launch and what they expected it to do. If you already know that the main character isn't the guy on the box, then the shock value of that twist is spoiled. To take the fans' expectations and deliberately betray them before making an outright mockery of them was ballsy as hell, but also a financial powder keg. Keep in mind that this was one of the most expensive productions of its time, and to throw its customers for that much of a curveball could have easily been career suicide for these guys. Even its own sequels haven't danced as close to the fire as this one. So it's no wonder that the very next game actually plays it much safer. In comparison, the events of Metal Gear Solid 2 seem almost alien to the rest of the series. Like so many other works of postmodernism, there's a loose sense of temporality, and a shaky grasp on what parts of it are supposed to be realistic. There are so many inconsistencies and holes that the fiction of this game might not even be rooted in the fiction of its own series. Like all nightmares, the events of this game are grounded in just enough logic and reason to make it scary, to juxtapose it against the comforting realism that we all experience in waking life. Nightmares rarely make sense. They rarely end on a satisfying conclusion or tell a really well-written story. Even during this game's most ridiculous moments, even when Dr. Robotnik is rollerblading around with this Ganguro girl and her flamenco vampire, it's still grounded in realism. It's a magical realism, one where this kind of stuff can happen while still maintaining the presentation of a gritty, R-rated hostage movie that ostensibly takes itself seriously. And the funny thing about these nightmares that take themselves so seriously is that they're usually very aware of the fact that they are nightmares. And that vampire too, it's... it's like... it's like being in a nightmare you can't wake up from. 
Jack, snap out of it! The nightmare that happens in this game manifests that self-awareness by staging it all as a VR simulation. If you're going to look at it from the wider canology of the other Metal Gear games released before this one, then that's seriously the only way you can explain away what's going on here. For starters, the preparatory logistics of Raiden's mission bogs down once you ask how he was supposed to get through the oil fence without Snake doing it before him, which is odd because the Colonel constantly reassures us that Snake wasn't an intended part of the simulation. Because they were never a part of the simulation. They're an unknown factor. You can take your simulation and we're out here, we bleed, we die. Calm down. Raiden tells us that he's trained in infiltration VR missions before, but he only says that if you've completed the tanker level. You are now designated Raiden. All right, Raiden. You've already covered infiltration and VR training. I've completed 300 missions in VR. I feel like some kind of legendary mercenary. You are now designated Raiden. This will be your first sneaking mission. The arms will naturally have to be procured on site. Which suggests that we might have actually been playing as Raiden playing a simulation of the tanker level, which is suggested even further by this line here. I've gone through VR training of the tanker mission before. Yeah, well I doubt it accurately simulates the events of that mission. It's also weird that in these flashbacks of the tanker mission, we're being shown a different tanker than the one we actually played. It looks like cut content, like the lengthy escape sequence that didn't make it into the final version of the game. Instead, we saw the tanker just snap in half and snakes spill out. If the details of this flashback are supposed to be canonical, then how do we know if we're looking at Raiden's VR mission or Snake's actual flashbacks? The plot of this game leads us down a loop of circular logic. We're also told that Raiden's VR missions are indistinguishable from the real thing, which he oddly says after encountering a supernatural vampire. Snake remarks that the vampire is something you'd never see in VR, but if VR is indistinguishable from reality, then what's stopping their whole waking existence from being VR? I've had extensive training, the kind that's indistinguishable from the real thing. You won't see that in VR, I guarantee. We can already see from the cutscenes that there really isn't anything stopping unrealistic characters from showing up in VR, so how could he possibly exist if this wasn't VR? The reality that Raiden had prepared himself for is torn apart and quickly turns into something more surreal. The name associations teased up to this point suddenly get taken literally, like how the Colonel, who's actually the AI core of GW, actually plays the role of a computer Colonel. The big shell is a shell interface that Raiden uses to interact with the simulation. His real name, Jack, is a plug we jack into to interact with the shell, while the Colonel processes all of our actions into plot outcomes. Suddenly, the fact that he flips through your game option screens inside the game no longer looks purely utilitarian. Right around the time that the AI kernel is revealed, lines of code begin to seep through the walls, and soon we hear Snake say this. If you run out of ammo, you can have mine. You got enough? Absolutely. Infinite ammo. This is the smoking gun. Here's Solid Snake, the picture-perfect representation of what Snake looks like as an idealized video game hero, just as he appeared during that glorious and fleeting first act. Even better is that he has cheats turned on, literally. This line of dialogue references an unlockable bandana from the first game that gave you unlimited ammo, so in this part of the game when Snake and Raiden are fighting alongside each other, what does he do? Well, he tosses you unlimited ammo. This nightmare isn't based on a fictional reality. It's based on our own. Despite being a series of metagames, no other Metal Gear has come this close to total absurdity. Snake actually turns on cheat modes right in front of you, and the plot just rolls with it. It's even underplayed. They make way less of a spectacle out of this than they do other fourth wall breaks. You're just supposed to roll with it, but it's absolutely unreal. About an hour later, we see Raiden directly reject the player's control to end the game. His girlfriend has been working with and reinforcing the Colonel's decisions this whole time, and is revealed to be another AI construct before suddenly appearing right in front of him in the flesh. Does she exist or not? Does it matter? We can tell that Raiden is almost completely delusional at this point, mostly from being a self-aware character in a fictional video game. Snake actually reminds us of that fact. There's no such thing in the world as absolute reality. Most of what they call real is actually fiction. 
Later on, Metal Gear Solid 4 would come out and mostly retcon this reading of the game, but it's important to know that Metal Gear Solid 4 wasn't supposed to happen. Metal Gear Solid 2, much like number 3, 4, and 5, were all billed to be the end of the series. This ending here was meant to be conclusive. These questions were deliberately left open to make room for a greater message, which is to stop worrying about canon and learn to love subtext. Of course, this story is a linear mess of holes and contradictions, but in the end, you're supposed to have your own fun trying to come to the conclusions yourself. Listen, don't obsess over words so much. Find the meaning behind the words, then decide. You can find your own name. And your own future. I know you didn't have much in terms of choices this time. But everything you felt, thought about during this mission is yours. And what you decide to do with them is your choice. Games are perfect for liars and sadists. They are manipulative illusions, very deliberately designed to dupe players into believing they have the agency of choice. But in reality, almost every possible interaction and outcome in a game has been carefully cultivated out of rigorous playtesting. Choices are cleverly presented under the false premises of role-playing. You are not a brilliant strategist. You are not a real estate tycoon. You are not cleverly making up these jokes by yourself. You are pretending. You are not a secret agent sent out on a mission to rescue the president, and you weren't last time either. You're tapping on a piece of plastic in front of a TV screen, playing a game. If a recurring theme of this game's story is to frustrate and confront players of the first game, then designing the gameplay around that theme must have been the easy part. It's easy to see that while the story of this game was written with absolutely cutting-edge design philosophies, its gameplay was very much constrained by antiquated design philosophies. It actually gets in the way of clarifying the point of the story. By comparison, look at Spec Ops. That game wowed critics by featuring a story with elusive causality, a delirious and delusional character, one who was deconstructed by the player's actions. Both games judge their audience while also asking their audience to judge themselves, and they both embrace ludonarrative dissonance in a morally unstable and cliched military setting. And of course, both games were falsely advertised. But one of these games struggles to make its point. The other demonstrates it vividly, and sparked a critical revelation. Spec Ops succeeded at pulling off all the stunts that backfired for MGS2, and there are a lot of reasons why. Of course, all of the Metal Gear games are loaded down with a lot of sequel baggage and bloated writing, but this story isn't supported by the player's actions nor driven by its core mechanics. Raiden's crisis of self occurs because Emma Emmerich uploads a virus to the core AI. Walker's crisis of self occurs because the player thoughtlessly shoots and kills hundreds if not thousands of other human beings. It's also odd that this heavy narrative about illusory choice is presenting an awfully choicey game. There's an incredible amount of different ways to sneak past guards. Your inventory is huge. There's an enormous amount of tricks you have up your sleeve if you bother to sort through them all and pick them all out. The downside is that this expansive toolset is bogged down by a bunch of fluff items. Seriously, how many people actually use the microphone outside of its one room? And unfortunately, it's not easy to pull off a lot of these moves thanks to a camera system that uses claustrophobic horror game angles. In the plant chapter, you have to do a good deal of sneaking without the radar, and that just shows off how much of an elaborate process you gotta go through just to point the camera at what your character is looking at. You gotta hold the direction buttons towards the wall while holding the triggers, and then you wiggle the stick and you can't let go of any of these buttons without breaking the action. The first person mode is a godsend, but peeking around corners with it limits your mobility and also exposes you from cover. By comparison, sneaking through the levels in the first Splinter Cell is night and day. It came out around the same time and proved that you can pull off a lot of these same moves with a much simpler control scheme, largely thanks to a completely controllable camera that's always peeking just over your character's line of sight. In fact, future Metal Gear games would take that very same camera from Splinter Cell, and suddenly, you no longer have to worry about getting spotted by guards who are out of frame. This anachronistic conflict between modern-day philosophies and dated sensibilities is further reflected by comparing it with modern art games, which usually use more abstract tokens to clearly demonstrate complicated concepts. Thing is, despite the game's mind-boggling postmodern plot, there isn't much of it reflected in the minutiae of its gameplay. Up until you run through Arsenal in the very end, its story about misinformation and misleading expectations is primarily delivered through cutscenes and not gameplay. But all that brilliantly changes in the third act. 
Like Spec Ops, the game boils up frustration and confusion that's shared both by the player and the character. It finally erupts here, breaking all conventions in a way that's still disturbing to this day. All of the plot's problems are resolved here too, and they're also finally being reflected by the gameplay. We were shown Hollywood action films every day. The kind with macho guys and big guns. They call it image training. Ugh. This monologue, when Raiden is talking about his past as a child soldier, that is the precise moment where the game breaks over itself. This line, where we find out that our character's backstory was a lie and that his real story was shaped by fiction, that's when players knew that the author has been subverting, betraying, and rejecting their expectations all along. And the reason why it works so well is because it breaks all the conventions and expectations that we've now grown accustomed to. The first thing that breaks is your character. After hearing the lies and confessions of nearly every other character in the game, it comes time for Raiden to do the same. In this cutscene, we find out that he's not actually the effeminate, wargame-trained rookie that we were so shocked to find ourselves playing as earlier. In fact, he has a backstory that's more sadistically macho than pretty much everyone else. He's not actually an empty jack that we can comfortably inhabit. He has baggage, and he's no longer keen to giving us full control. Stripping him naked here serves a dual purpose. It highlights the brutal rebirth of this character while also giving him a gameplay-affecting reason to reject the player's control. Of course, back in 2002, no one wanted to test to see if you could have a dude's junk hanging out anyway. So for this segment, Raiden can't bear to show himself to our camera, which is especially weird considering the life-or-death circumstances he's under. So you can't free his arms for the attack moves that you've gotten yourself used to. Your inventory is completely empty and Raiden actually sneezes against your will too. Your vulnerability and confusion couldn't be more overstated, especially because this chapter also breaks the physical space of the game, beginning by framing the scene in The Memory of Shadow Moses. Just like in the last game, your hero is strapped to a torture chair by Ocelot, the big bad, and another female henchman. You're literally inside a room from the first game, right down to the blurry textures and low-poly furniture. This situation, I find it very nostalgic. You continue on into Arsenal gear, where geometry is a far cry from the rest of the game, if only because lines of code and computer windows are floating in the air. The translucent floor lights up with every step. There's a bottomless pit surrounding the whole stage, and once you finally make it to the end, you might notice that this room looks awfully familiar. And again, these weird gamey visual effects aren't explained away either. You sneak through another arsenal gear in Metal Gear Solid 4, and it looks nothing like this. It looks kinda like a battleship, but in this game it looks more like a glitchy map editor. You're in the belly of the beast, complete with rooms that are named after digestive organs. Space is broken, and so is your character and his relationship with the other characters. The whole game has built up to this moment where Raiden, naked, shivering and sneezing, is completely dwarfed by Solid Snake, who's gloriously over-equipped with the same outfit he was wearing in the tanker. This part of the game shows Raiden's admiration of Snake, and by extension the players as well, through both cutscenes and gameplay. Note that once this cutscene is over, we start the next scene from Snake's point of view. His health meter is longer, his bullets hit for more damage, he's a better shot, and he's also surrounded by an invisible wall that you can't walk away from. And the last thing that's broken is the entire pretense of this being a stealth game at all. For the next two rooms, you and Snake kill your way through hundreds of these weird sci-fi ninja guys, and it's a total bloodbath! It's completely antithetical to the entire rest of the game. It's like the game itself forgot that it was supposed to be about stealth, because now it just gives you a sword, an invisible wall, a bunch of bad guys, and infinite ammo. It's insane! You and Snake just blast your way through these guys, and Snake does most of the work. You finally end it off with a sword fight against the former president of the United States, who's also revealed to be the last thing in the way of the Patriots controlling the world. All these twists and in turns reveal the metagame nature of the plot in an over-the-top fashion, and is driven home by a resolution that asks us to discredit the previous entirety of the whole game. Was the bad guy really bad? Were we really the good guy? And whose story should we believe? Who was lying? And is there anything differently we could have done that whole time? These are the kinds of questions that the game asks you in the end. They also ask about the state of the world outside of the video game, and they challenge the player's perceptions of truth. 
What are you going to do with the experience of having played this game? MGS2 asks you these things by evoking postmodernism to make a statement about the outrageousness of its hype, by setting the game outside the canon of its own series, and by embracing ludonarrative dissonance before deconstructing it right in front of the player. It uses these narrative techniques to warn about the dangers of memes, to show media consumers of the digital age that misinformation can lead to lies being culturally accepted as truths. And of course, the game uses the term memes in an ironically more academic sense than we use the word today. It harkens back to Richard Dawkins' theory, which compared the passage of information onto future generations with that of genes. Raiden, are you receiving? We're still here. Who are you? To begin with, we're not what you'd call human. Over the past 200 years, a kind of consciousness formed layer by layer in the crucible of the White House. It's not unlike the way life started in the oceans four billion years ago. We are formless. We are the very discipline and morality that Americans invoke so often. How can anyone hope to eliminate us? As long as this nation exists, so will we. Right now, are the Colonel and Rose really AI or some kind of totally abstract cloud consciousness that really did seep out of the White House? It's a tempting mystery, but the minor logistics behind it are never really explained, even in the sequels, and no matter how hard you look, you'll never find a foolproof answer. But it doesn't matter what they are. Instead, what matters is what they represent, which is collective social control through memes. They warn against the social epidemic of junk data, which leads us to see trends where none exist. On the internet, information overload is the norm. People are always looking for a major tidal wave of change when something ultimately insignificant happens. Memes are collaboratively filtered information. They're super-powered nano-stories. They're propagated through mass preference, deliberately selected and popularized. Memetic online journalism is the survival of the most agreeable information. The nasty truths get forgotten. The inarguable counter-arguments get drowned out and dismissed. But in the current digitized world, trivial information is accumulating every second, preserved in all its triteness, never fading, always accessible. The S3 plan does not stand for solid snake simulation. What it does stand for is selection for societal sanity. Right. You seem to think that our plan is one of censorship. Are you telling me it's not? You're being silly. What we propose to do is not to control content, but to create context. Create context? The digital society furthers human flaws and selectively rewards development of convenient half-truths. Everyone withdraws into their own small gated community, afraid of a larger forum. They stay inside their little ponds, leaking whatever truth suits them into the growing cesspool of society at large. The different cardinal truths neither clash nor mesh. No one is invalidated, but nobody is right. Not even natural selection can take place here. The world is being engulfed in truth. And this is the way the world ends, not with a bang but a whimper. They're talking about confirmation bias, and in the digital age, confirmation bias controls information. And it's not just a social phenomenon, but psychological too, and it's almost unavoidable. Remember this line from the end? What you think you see is only as real as your brain tells you it is. In this elaborate, convoluted plot, Raiden unknowingly enslaved humanity because he wanted to believe that he could live up to Solid Snake. We enabled him to do so because we wanted to play a sequel to Metal Gear Solid. Why did he do that? Think about the overwhelming allure of this secret agent role. Think about how people are so eager to obey dangerous orders when given the opportunity to lie to others. Think about how eager people were to abuse each other during the Stanford prison experiment. Think about the role that viral media creators play. Think of the guys who actively work to trick everyone else into propagating their memes. The people who tally preferences, cross-reference trends, and enumerate words. The people who measure thoughts with scientific models, and carefully alter and manipulate their message to suit the kind of responses they want. The truth you believe in, is it genuine? Are you enabling lies? If you're watching this video right now, then there's an automated analytics system that is tracking your view. 
and meticulously measures when you started this video, when you're gonna stop, and what you clicked along the way. Big Brother isn't me. It's all of us. Big Brother is watching, but we're staring right back. The masses are now in control of our information, for better or for worse. What that means is that you're in control of the entire world. Take your thoughts and put them out there. Public scrutiny will decide what's right or wrong. Collective, cultural, cumulative memories are what we all leave for the future. Everything you know, everything you're thinking about, could not have happened without that effort. And now, we are all responsible.